The New American Standard Bible is the best Bible translation, and so is the Lexham English Bible for certain people in certain circumstances. Who are those people? What are those circumstances? But first, a blast from the comic pages past. I was never a big fan of Tank McNamara. I watched and played a fair bit of football as a kid, but somehow the humor of that strip just didn't connect with me. But there's one line from it that my dad and I quoted to one another many times because it's such a great send up of what football commentators do. A little kid was playing with some football announcer action figures and he had them say, Troy Aikman is the most underrated player in football. And then the kid had the other announcer figure say, and so is Emmett Smith. The joke is that these commentators are always saying that so-and-so is the best or that so-and-so, such-and-such player is the most underrated player. He should get talked about more often. That's what my whole The Best Bible Translation series is all about. Sorry if I've confused some people who've only read the cover. Troy Aikman is a great Bible translation, and so is Emmett Smith. Which Bible is best? All the good ones. But highly literal, formal translations are best for certain circumstances. In this video, I will cover the New American Standard Bible and the Lexham English Bible, but much of what I say will apply to more obscure, less popular literal translations like the literal standard version. At the end, I'll accede to popular demand and make some comments about John MacArthur's Legacy Standard Bible, or at least about its marketing. So, for whom is the NASB the best? Under what circumstances is it the best? Number one, the NASB is the best translation for you if your church already uses it. The greatest Bible expositor I have ever heard, in my humble estimation, my pastor from age 16 to age 34, Mark Minnick of Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina, has used the New American Standard Bible for 20 years. I was there. I was a church member. When we voted, I voted, to have liberty to use other translations beside the King James Version. I was there when Pastor Minnick started preaching from the NASB. To my King James only brother, I might point out that it's been over two decades and he hasn't gone liberal yet, nor has he diminished one iota his belief in Christ's deity or the efficacy of Christ's blood. I've been gone from that church for six and a half years, having moved across the country, and I haven't changed my opinion. Mark Minnick is the best expository preacher I have ever heard. His Ephesians series changed my life. It was God's means of calling me to a Bible teaching ministry. He has had an incredible impact on me. I couldn't believe it when my friends who attended with me my freshman year of college chose the next year to attend a different church. But I took note of what they said to me, and they said it kindly. They said that our church was arrogant. Now, I know these church people. There are countless godly, humble, faithful people at my old church. But when you have the best preacher, you're tempted to drop little comments to other Christians about that best preaching that maybe aren't wise. I can praise him because I'm gone now. There is a good kind of pride, a sort of loyalty for and love for your church, but it gets shaded with a little bit of sin when you're there and you tell other people about it. The same can happen with good Bible translations, the NASB included. Christians can start to pick up the attitude, we're the faithful few who are willing to stick it out with a truly literal Bible translation. Unlike the pansies at Church X down the street who demand an easy to read version. We've got steak, they've got jello. That attitude is real. I've picked it up in the air and not just in my old church. And just as it isn't my old pastor's fault that some people honor him in a way that he wouldn't want, he is so humble and gracious. It is no knock on the quality of the NASB that some people view it as the one true Bible. So to the person in my old church that I still love so much and just visited a few weeks ago, don't be proud about the translation you have, but if you're considering which one to use, consider the providence of God. You're in that church, your pastor, your shepherd chose the NASB. That would be a fine choice for you. Be content, even if the cool kids are onto the ESV and it's actually sold in the church bookstore. Get a nice NASB. I like the Clarion edition from Cambridge the best, but I'm gonna be honest. Though I love and admire Pastor Minnick and cite his influence on me over and over, Though I think that any sign of graciousness you see in me is largely due to the indelible ways in which he shaped me, I would not choose the NASB as my church's main Bible. I think it's too literal to the point of occasionally fetishizing literalness. It used to say right on the cover, the most literal but still readable. I think that's what it said on my 
horrifically ugly paperback version of the NASB that I had years ago. I have to say that of all the major modern evangelical English Bible versions, the NASB went the longest time without having very many truly beautiful editions, and the longest time putting out primarily ugly ones. But do check out that clarion, it is to die for. I did a whole video on literal Bible translation, one in which I imagined Incredi NASB, a Bible translation that outliterals all the other Bibles until they're all crying in the dust. We are not worthy to unlatch the leather strap on your journaling edition, O NASB. But I actually think the King James Version shows a better way, that ultimately no translation can convey every last nuance and connection available in the Hebrew and Greek. So those translations that are meant for pulpit use, official use in churches, shouldn't pretend that they can get there. I'll have more to say about this when I mention the marketing for the Legacy Standard Bible at the end of this video. So be humble, NASB lovers. Other churches have good reasons for choosing other versions. But what all this means is that, number two, the NASB and the LEB are best for Hebrew and Greek students. Literal is useful. It's even best for certain people in certain circumstances. I was just talking with the head of Lexham Press, my boss, a gracious Christian man, and he commented to me something that I myself have often felt. The difference between the NASB and the Lexham English Bible is that we at Faith Life have never proposed the LEB as anything but a study tool. We haven't put it in print despite repeated requests. We may someday. So I can't say stick with the LEB if your church uses it because no churches are using it. And that's by design. The LEB was actually born on a computer as a set of glosses. Then it got stitched together by humans into real sentences. There's more we'd like to do with the LEB. I can't really speak officially, but I can just say kind of informally, we'd like to do more for it editorially. But it is so expensive to make a Bible translation and to do it well. People will put up with typos in a regular book. They'll be happy with 95% perfect. And that number is achievable for a reasonable price. But to go from 95% to 98% perfect, that's a really tall order. And to go to 100% is almost impossible and impossibly expensive. I helped edit a translation, a Bible translation, the Lexham English Septuagint. It was such a privilege. I enjoyed it so much. And there were like 10 of us working on it. Th that is just expensive because we all like to eat and wear clothes. Don't take good Bible translations for granted. To do them well takes resources. But that was a digression. Let me get back to my point number two, I think. The NASB and LEB are great for Hebrew and Greek students because they tend to stick to the forms and word order and number and other grammatical features of the original Hebrew and Greek more than other translations. This is precisely why they're appealing to my conservative Christian crowd. I think, as I've already said at great length in other videos, that this appeal demonstrates some confusion about what translation is and what it can be. But the end result of highly literal translation is that it's easier for students to match up what they see in the originals with what they see in the English. People with some Hebrew and Greek knowledge can sort of triangulate. They can pinpoint A, the originals, point B, the NASB or LEB, and they can sort of reason to point C, the, the meaning. But that meaning is nearly always present in one of the less literal translations, in fact, in all of them. Let me give an example. In Logos, you can run a Bible word study, I do this all the time, to see how a given translation translates a Hebrew or Greek word. Before I did this work, I predicted that the standard Hebrew word tov, whose most common gloss is good, would be translated in numerous different ways in the New International Version, but in fewer different ways in the NASB. I predicted that good would be the predominant English gloss in the latter, in the NASB. And this is exactly what I found. The NIV renders the word tov in far more different ways than does the NASB. Too many to count on my YouTube salary, sorry. Each little sliver on this ring graph, basically a pie chart with the middle cut out, is a different way the NIV translates tov. The NASB has noticeably fewer ways of rendering this common word, as you can see on this ring graph from the Bible Word Study in Logos. And look, the translation good takes up a bigger proportion of the graph than it does in the NIV graph. This kind of thing is considered game, set, match for people who assume that literal or equals better, that literal equals moral in Bible translation. But let's look at an example where the NASB translates tov as good, but the NIV goes with something other than good. 
Here's the NASB at 2 Samuel 19, 34 to 35. This is where David is re-entering Jerusalem after his forced exile, and he invites Barzillai the Gileadite to join him. But Barzillai said to the king, How long have I yet to live, that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am now eighty years old. Can I distinguish between good and bad? There's that word, tov, translated good in the NASB here. I'll continue. Or can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Or can I hear any more the voice of singing men and women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? I read a little more of the context for a reason. Listen to the NIV. I am now 80 years old. Can I tell the difference between what is enjoyable and what is not? The NIV translates tov as enjoyable here. What giveth? At first, even I thought that the NIV translators might have been unnecessarily explanatory here, unnecessarily interpretive. But then I looked at the lexicons. I noticed something really important. Tov actually does have a common sense meaning pleasant or desirable. In fact, the careful lexicographers who made the standard Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament give Tov eight or nine senses, depending on how you count. It would take a while to explain. The NASB and the computer brain behind the LEB chose the most common gloss, the word good. They get the literal award, but the NIV translators were actually more attentive to the context, and they chose the more accurate sense. In this context, Barzillai is not talking about his ability to discern the moral quality of things, good and bad. He's talking about tasting food and drink, listening to music from male and female singers. Enjoyable is a better translation. Not that good is wrong, it's helpful for Hebrew students because it makes it easier to match the English to the Hebrew when you are laboriously going back and forth between the two, trying to learn the latter, the ancient Hebrew language. Let me follow this up with a little more explanation. Mark Strauss made a comment about literal Bible translation that has had a massive impact on my thinking about Bible translation. He said that often what passes for literal Bible translation in people's minds is this. When Bible translations consistently use the main English equivalent they learned in their vocabulary lists when studying the language back in seminary, that kind of becomes the literal translation of that word. So, tov means good. That is a convenient gloss, and for the purposes of learning vocab, it's a good and enjoyable one. But no translator can afford to use the same gloss every time a word appears. Language just doesn't work like that, as I so frequently say. The King James translators go out of their way in their preface to explain that doing this sort of thing, using the same English equivalent every time a Hebrew or Greek word appears, is bad translation practice. I've memorized their droll takedown of this practice. It saveth more of curiosity than of wisdom. For a video on why the NASB and LEB are the best, I haven't done much praising of these translations, I confess. So let me just say that when we're talking about major evangelical English Bibles, we're not talking about big differences, but small ones, like the difference between good and enjoyable. If all I had on the dessert island with me is the NASB, I would be beyond grateful. I myself check the NASB, especially in the Old Testament, because my Hebrew is a bit weaker than my Greek, but also in the more difficult parts of the New Testament, Luke and Hebrews and Acts, when I'm struggling to follow the Hebrew and Greek. And the NASB is a fine choice for the situation in which my old pastor found himself. He was preaching to a congregation in a Christian college town, a congregation that was chock full of people who had studied at least a little Hebrew and Greek. He made a good choice, and I don't fault him. In 1999, given his options, I think he made the best choice. The NASB was the best Bible translation for him in our church. I just doubt that many pastors are in precisely his circumstance. Before I get on to talking about the Legacy Standard Bible and its marketing and actually closing out this video, which will happen, I promise, I just have to say I'm in one of my favorite places on my property because it's one of my wife's favorite places. She is a micro-urban flower farmer, and I actually did make this greenhouse for her. I bought a kit. The wood was pre-drilled and pre-cut, and it was just so fun to put this 16 by 8 greenhouse together. I also made these tables from an old chicken coop that we had and some fence slats, and it's just been a delight. Also, it's quiet and away from children, so there's that. Now here's a special postscript on the Legacy Standard Bible. As promised, a lot of people have been asking me what I think of the LSB. Long before the LSB came out, I wrote an article about it, full well knowing that I had not 
yet at that time read a single verse in the yet-to-be-released translation. Well, except for the countless verses from the NASB 1995 that, I'm guessing, have been brought over verbatim into the LSB. If you wish to read the article I wrote on the LSB, Google will help you find it somehow. I wrote it for scholars and church leaders, and I published it in a sort of semi-scholarly forum. In it, though, I said everything I really care to say about the LSB itself at this point. I want to sound a cautionary note here, not about the LSB itself, but about the marketing claims regarding it. The two are very different things in my mind. I want to keep them totally separate, so what I'm about to say is not a criticism of the LSB. Here is the statement about the Legacy Standard Bible that I want to evaluate. This is the best translation the English language has ever seen. I've been waiting my whole lifetime, glad I'm still alive, to hold this in my hands. I can't commend it enough to every believer who wants to know what the Bible says in its original autographs. This is as close as the English language has ever gotten to that. Translations have tended to go toward the reader, to accommodate the reader. When we know a translation should take into account only one person, and that's the author. And the author of all of Scripture is the Holy Spirit who works through the writers. So this goes back to what the author said. It's up to the preacher to close the gap between the author and the modern world. That's what expositors do, and this is the perfect tool for Bible expositors and serious Bible students. All I really know of John MacArthur is his public ministry, and I have very sincere respect and appreciation for that ministry. This and that comment here and there over the years I have disagreed with from John MacArthur. Who hasn't? But in the main, he's been a responsible and careful biblical expositor over the decades, and he's done much to rediscover expository preaching in our era. I am a comparative nobody. What I am about to say, I say with no glee, and I pray for humility as I speak. Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. In MacArthur's zeal to promote a tool he truly believes in, and I've said before, and I say again, I do not think he's in this for the money. MacArthur nonetheless ends up overreaching. This is as close as the English language has ever gotten to what the Bible says in its original autographs? What does that even mean? It seems to mean that the LSB is about as literal as a translation can get. And I've already offered in this video and in others, especially my Incredit Nasby video, some, I hope, gentle, but I hope firm critiques of that kind of viewpoint. This is overreach. A translation should take into account only one person, and that's the author. What does that even mean when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to Bible translation? I think he means what he goes on to say, that it's the preacher's job to close the gap between the author and the modern world. That idea, at least, makes sense. But if I'm going to be persnickety like he's kind of being right here, I'm going to have to stick with exactly, precisely, literally what MacArthur said. And he said that we don't need to have any concern for the reader whatsoever. And again, I just can't even process that. The whole idea, the whole point of translation is to make accessible to the reader what the original said. And we do have to know some things about that reader. We have to know which dialect of which language he or she speaks and writes so we can translate in accessible, intelligible terms as much as possible. It's worthwhile to know how old your audience is because maybe it's okay to have a Bible translation that's more accessible to third graders or prisoners like the NIRV that I've already talked about. It's worthwhile to know the vocabulary of your intended readership because there's no sense using a word they won't know. Even if it's technically part of the language, it shows up in the English dictionary, if there's a suitable equivalent that they do know. We've seen this kind of thing before on my humble channel, this idea that it's possible to translate the Bible in such a way so as to basically eliminate all interpretation. We're gonna give you just what the author said, no more, no less, with no human involvement. Actually, we had a computer from the future translate this Bible because we wanted no human mediation in the translation process. I'm not exaggerating much here. MacArthur said this was the perfect tool for serious Bible students. Now, again, I know marketing language. I live in the United States of America. I'm pretty sure I know what MacArthur intends. But if I'm not permitted to interpret what he said, only relay it, only interpret it literally, technically, what he said was that the LSB is perfect. You know this is ridiculous. You know he didn't mean that. 
and you know that the LSB is in fact not perfect. So why did MacArthur sort of say that it was? Should I interpret him literally, or should I interpret him charitably? I hope the answer is obvious. The LSB may turn out to be an excellent tool for exposition. I dare say, without ever having looked at it, that I would be able to exposit God's word carefully and faithfully using this tool. But I dare not say, with all due respect to Dr. MacArthur, that the LSB is noticeably better at literal Bible translation than other existing translations like the NASB or LAB. I showed in my Increda NASB video that you can never ever produce a perfectly literal Bible translation in any language. Those who assume you can generally haven't ever translated anything. Dr. MacArthur has been working in the Greek and, I think, Hebrew, I presume, for decades. I'm sorry, but he ought to know better than to talk the way he's talking in this marketing piece. Seeking the holy grail of literality is a Sisyphean task. It's an oblique asymptote that never reaches the x-axis. It is the ice cream bar in the very bottom of the freezer toward which your six-year-old can stretch out his hand with all his might, but it will always be just out of his reach. One of my missions in life is to end Bible translation tribalism. And the kind of talk that Dr. MacArthur indulges in here is, I think, well-meaning, earnest, zealous, and wrong. Wrong because it stokes tribalism. What are all Dr. MacArthur's buddies, people he has in for conferences, supposed to do now with their ESV and their NASB 1995s? Are they supposed to continue using imperfect tools for exposition? The LSB is a useful tool, but other translations are also useful tools. May not be great marketing speak, but it does have the advantage of being true. The strength of formal translations like the NASB or LSB or LEB is that they stick so close to the forms of the Hebrew and Greek. That method of translation is good and useful, especially for students. But the weakness of such translations is also that they stick so close to the forms of the Hebrew and Greek. I don't know why God structured languages the way he did, but it seems clear to me after years of fascination with language and translation, especially Bible translation, that because God made perfect translation between languages impossible, it's good and useful to have different kinds of translations. I think it's great to have some that maintain a lot of distance between original writer and today's reader. It's useful, but it's not obligatory. It's not a morally superior choice, especially when perfect consistency there is ultimately impossible. As old Dr. Bob Jones Sr. once said, you can do what you ought to do. And if you simply can't do something like translate the Bible with perfect literal consistency in such a way so as to eliminate all human interpretation and to maintain perfect distance between the original writers and the contemporary readers, then it just can't be a moral obligation. I haven't read a single verse in the LSB. I expect it to be a good and useful translation like the NASB before it. But mark my words, literally, if Dr. MacArthur preaches for another five or ten years, he will find errors in his own beloved LSB. Let's be careful the way we talk about Bible translations. Let's not stoke unnecessary division.